G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews and the Long Range Beyond Visual Line of Sight FPV project. And I mentioned right from the get-go that this was going to be focusing on safety. And yep, safety is the number one priority in this project because you'll notice that virtually every country in the world forbids people flying beyond visual line of sight using FPV. And you might think, well, why is that? Are they just killjoys? Are they just, you know, trying to spoil our fun? Well, no, the regulators believe, they, uh, they believe that there is an unacceptable risk associated with flying a radio control model beyond your visual line of sight. And that unacceptable risk comes because of something called situational awareness or the lack of situational awareness that occurs when you do that. Now, most of you will have heard of situational awareness. If you haven't, let me explain briefly what it is. It's simply being aware of where you are and where everybody else is and where everything else is. It's being aware of the situation in which you find yourself. Now, it's not just aviation, it's all aspects of life involve situational awareness and people die, countless people die every year in all sorts of accidents because they lack critical situational awareness. Good example is you're walking down the street with your phone, texting away and you bump into somebody. Oh, didn't see you. Well, you, of course you probably did see them but your brain wasn't registering the fact that there was someone coming towards you. You were focused on your phone. It, basically your other senses shut down and you were in a little world of your own. You had zero situational awareness. There are videos on YouTube of people falling into fountains and walking into lampposts and all sorts of things because they're using their phones, they lack situational awareness. And those are funny and humorous, but the reality is that if you are dealing with aviation, a lack of situational awareness is often fatal. And this is why regulators don't want us flying BV loss because they say our situational awareness is severely compromised if we're flying beyond our own visual line of sight. If we're relying on our cameras and our technology, then we're unsafe. So today, first of all, I'm going to look at the different aspects, the different inputs that make up our situational awareness, our picture, our map of the world around us, because what tends to happen with the human mind is that we create a model of the world around us. Inside our head, we have a little 3D model and we know where things roughly are. So for example, you walk into a room and you sit down and you're facing you know, the front of the, you walk in through the door, sit down in a chair, you know there's a door behind you because you walk through it. In your mind you have a model of that room and the door is behind you so that enables you to be, if there was a fire you'd know exactly where to go because you know you came through the door. You have situational awareness because your mind has built this model of the world around it. So we use all these different senses here to build a model of the world when we're flying whether it's manned aviation or whether it's FPV, whether it's proximity FPV, which is like within visual line of sight, and perhaps with a spotter, or whether it is BV loss. We have, uh, we build this map in our minds of what's going on. And the more information we can get, then the better our situational awareness. So let's take a look at the regulator's claims that when you fly BV loss FPV, you do not have enough situational awareness to remain safe. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to basically give each of these a score you know, out of 10 uh, as to how effective they are. And first of all, we look at visual eyes, you know, the things on the front of your head. These are our primary sense for creating situational awareness. We see stuff, unless you are blind, in which case you're probably unlikely to be flying an aircraft. Um, you will use your eyes as the primary source of information. When we fly line of sight, our eyes are probably our, certainly our number one source of information for creating that situational awareness. And when we fly um, proximity or BV loss, our eyes through our goggles provide that maximum sense. So let's say you're in, in proximity FPV, you have got goggles on, you have got a camera on your model, and you've got a spotter standing next to you. You've got two sets of eyes, one's on the plane, one's on the ground. That gives you 10 out of 10 for your situational awareness, the visual effect of your situational awareness. That's a mighty, that's full score. You can't get better than that because you're looking from the air, your spotter's looking from the ground, if there's anything going on, you're going to know about it because you'll see it, right? Let's go now to manned aircraft. Now, you're sitting in the cockpit of the aeroplane. You've got the best seat in the house. But, and this is a big but, and this is one thing the regulators perhaps don't quite understand. In most aircraft, your field of view is quite severely limited. You have a large engine out front of you with a cowling or the nose of an aircraft if it's a twin, so you can't see much down out front because you've got this big engine blocking your view. So that limits you. If you uh, look straight down, you've got the floor of the aircraft. And so, unless you're in a helicopter with the little side view panels, you can't see anything below you. Below you is just a big blind spot. Uh, if you're in a low wing aircraft, then if you look out to your left and look out to your right, or the other way around, um, 
you can't see below the wing. The wing's in the way. You can't see a lot of the stuff below you out that way either. If you're in a high wing aircraft, then you can't see up because you've got your wing above you and you can't see up to the right or the left because, again, you've got the wing. Likewise, the rear-facing visibility in a lot of aircraft is minimal and to, to look out the back, you've got to swing right round and in most cases with a seat belt on and a pilot seat and the cramped conditions, it's not practical to swing all the way around and look behind you. So pilots have a very, they have a good seat but it's a very limited field of view. So I'm going to give our pilots, I'm going to give our pilots a 5 out of 10. Surprisingly, 5 out of 10, that's all they get. And I think we can back this up because there are many instances, recorded instances, where a lack of visual awareness creating the situational awareness has caused media collisions. And I'll show you in a picture on the board later on how that works. Right, so 5 out of 10. Okay, BV loss. What about BV loss? How do we score there? Well, I'm actually going to say we score pretty damn well. Now, we don't have a spotter's eyes, and even if we had a spotter beside us, he can't see 5, 10 miles away, so count him out. He's out for the count. Uh, on your model, though, you've got a camera, and... Modern FPV gear is quite different to the old stuff. When I started flying FPV, we had crappy cameras with like, you know, um, 400 lines of resolution. It was really, really poor. And the video goggles or screens we used were terrible. My old Fat Shark Base Edition, they were blurry and color fringed and everything. They were terrible sets of, it surprises me we could fly at all, right? But things have come a long way. Now we have really, really good cameras, CMOS and CCD. We have 800 by 600 pixel video glasses. We have much better quality video transmitters and receivers. So I believe that because we have, well, in the case of cameras, a 150 to 170 degree cone of view, the field of view, vertical and horizontal, it's about 150 to 170 degrees. That's a massive area of the sky we can see in front of our aircraft. We can see down because the camera is almost always near the nose of your aircraft. So there's not much blocking your view down. You can see all out to the left. You can see out to the right. You can, if you've got pan and tilt, you can look up and you can look right around 360 degrees. So we have, I'd give us seven. I would actually give us a seven. Better than being in a manned aircraft. And this is where I think the aviators have, or the regulators have fallen down a bit. They, most of the regulators have flown a manned aircraft. And they get a good view out the window. I can see my house from here as they fly past. But they've never flown a modern FPV model with the latest FPV equipment. So they don't know just how good this stuff has gone. I was flying out here at the airfield, well, probably six months ago. I had a spotter beside me, as you do, and as I was flying down the runway, I saw an aircraft coming. And I said to the spotter, is that an aircraft coming? And he looked around and said, yeah, but it's a long way off. I could see it through my FPV gear, through my goggles. It was over a mile away, and I could see it before the spotter saw it. That's how good the gear is these days. It really is that good. Further evidence? Here's a video that I just put on my Exit channel yesterday showing a drone filming a Cessna 172 flying past at night. So obviously the drone pilot could see the 172, even though he's probably at least half a mile away, and he panned around and followed it. So these cameras are good enough, well, they're as good as the human eye almost when it comes to spotting stuff in the air. And we don't have any of the aircraft structure in the way causing the problem. So we get a seven out of 10. We beat the manned aviator. So the regulators need to get out there, get in the field, get some of the stuff, have a fly, see for yourself how much better it is than it ever was and how you've really got a fantastic view from a BV loss FPV model. Right, now we turn to our ears, auditory, auditory. Now, um, if you're flying proximity FPV, that means you're within a mile or so of yourself and you may or may not have a spotter, but it doesn't really matter because you have your ears working. And when you put video goggles on, your ears don't stop working. It's, a, I think, probably the regulators think your ears stop working when you put the goggles on. It doesn't work that way. They don't cover your ears. They don't have plugs to stop the noise coming in. You can hear. And out here at the airfield, I often hear an aircraft coming long before I can see it. I might be sitting here. I can hear an aircraft. I go out. I look around the skies. I can't see it for about another 30 seconds. Then it comes into view tiny speck because aircraft are very noisy things. They have huge, powerful engines, massive propellers or rotor blades chopping the air up, and sound is just a disturbance in the air. So these things are making a hell of a noise, making a huge racket. So the sound comes long before you can see them. And so if you're flying proximity FPV, that is to say that the model is within, you know, say even a mile or so, you will hear an aircraft coming long before your spotter will see it. So that means you've got a bonus there. So you've got 10 out of 10 for your auditory capabilities. You can hear, unless you're deaf, you can get 10 out of 10 there. That's a great score. Now, BV loss FPV, well, you get a big fat zero for that. Big fat zero because you can't hear things that are five, 10 miles away. Uh, just doesn't happen. So you get nothing. Now, what about manned aviation? 
Well, guess what? They also get a big fat zero because, as I said, aircraft are very noisy devices. They have these big engines, they have these props, these rotor blades. If you're stuck in the cockpit of a helicopter or a aircraft, you can't hear anything that's going on outside. You can't. The noise of the engine drowns it out. And if the aircraft has got enough sound insulation to stop you from being deafened by the engine, then it's also stopping any other noise from coming in. So you can't hear a damn thing, right? So you get a zero as well. Now it's time to look at the technology aids that help situational awareness. And the most important technology aid pilots have to maintain their situational awareness is the radio. Radio. What traditionally happens if you're flying in uncontrolled airspace, which is where we should be flying, not in controlled airspace, but Class G airspace, is that pilots call up every 10 minutes or so, giving their altitude, their heading, and their position from a particular reference. Usually there's some kind of reference on the ground. There might be an airfield, there might be a, a mountain, there might be a, um, a road or something, and they'll give a reference. You know, They'll give their call sign and give that information so that other pilots know where they are and which way they're headed. This is essential to maintain safety in the air because you have multiple aircraft flying around, you need to know that there's someone um, at your altitude, um, two miles ahead of you, heading towards you because then you can start taking evasive action before you even see them. So this is, this, this is use of the radio. So um, manned aircraft can transmit and receive on the aviation band. So not only can they hear other aviators telling them where they are, but they can broadcast their own position and advise other aviators where they are. So, it means that everyone knows where everyone else is. So that's good. In the case of, I'm gonna put a stroke through here, and we're gonna have two scores for this. If you have an aircraft with a radio and the pilot is using the radio, those are two must-haves, then the radio provides another 10 points of situational awareness. It's as important as your eyes. More important than this because your eyes are so limited in a manned aircraft. 10 out of 10, but however, and this is the ironic, this is the amazing thing. I cannot believe this for one moment. Some, not all aircraft have to have radios by law. In the USA and in New Zealand, if you're only going to be flying in uncontrolled airspace, which is where we fly as hobbyists, you don't need, you don't require to have a radio as a legal, it's not a legal requirement. You can fly an aircraft without a radio. How is that? And if you don't have a radio, don't have any radio at all, then you get a zero, don't you? And the other thing is, pilot may have a radio, it may be, um, he installed, but he might not be using it. I've seen pilots turn the radios off because they're too noisy and they interrupt them. And I've seen pilots that never hardly make a call. I've had planes come in here at the airport and they've just come straight in. They've got radios, but they never bothered to call up or they're on the wrong frequency. So radio is only a 10 out of 10 if it's used properly. And far too often, the radios aren't used properly or they're switched off or they're not even installed. So it can go down to zero. If the pilot doesn't have a radio, it's a zero. You get no benefit from a radio you don't have. Right. Let's have a look at proximity FPV. Well, I take a radio with me when I'm flying FPV, whether it's proximity or not, because I like to know when an aircraft is coming. Now, I can't transmit, or well, I can transmit, but I don't transmit. Um, most people wouldn't be allowed to transmit because they don't have the necessary certification, most hobbyists. So you only get to hear aircraft calling up. You don't get to tell them where you are. So that's a five out of 10. That's a five out of 10. It might be a good idea actually for regulators to reconsider this and say, well, it would be really handy if we knew where people were flying, so maybe we should let them call up on the radio. But at the moment, they don't. You can't do that, right? So five out of 10. BV loss. It's the same with BV loss. You can have a scanner, and I recommend everybody who wants to fly FPV goes out onto eBay, spends 30 or 40 bucks buying an old secondhand scanner with aviation band capabilities, and throw it in their pocket when they go flying. You can hear aircraft calling up from miles away, long before you can hear them with your ears, long before you can see them with your eyes. And so it's a safety thing. If you hear someone call up saying, we're you know, five miles away heading and you know that's in your direction, um, then even if they say they're flying at 1500 feet or something, you can be alert, alert, you can be aware, situational awareness, that there's an aircraft coming and fly lower or maybe even land, it's up to you. So that's the whole thing. It can significantly contributes to your situational awareness. So we'll give it a five for both of those, right? Five there. Now, other, what's other? Um, well, other is the new technologies that are coming out and there are quite a few of them. The most obvious one is a transponder. Now, increasingly, in fact, I think all aircraft operating in controlled airspace in New Zealand and in the USA, I think have to have transponders fitted by 2020 or 2021. This will probably be ADS-B, which is just a particular type of transponder. And so with a transponder fitted, it's like, have, it's like a pilot with automatic radio calls. The aircraft itself through the transponder broadcasts its position, its heading, its altitude, its speed, 
and it receives that information from other aircraft so that it knows where they are. So we have electronic um, situational awareness. So this becomes a huge boon and there are things like uh, TCAS, which is an anti-collision system which relies on these signals and it's got a computer which automatically figures out you're going to hit that plane, pull up or dive or turn left or turn right. So that can be a massive boost to situational awareness if it's fitted and if it's used. But as I say, it's only required for controlled airspace. So if you have someone you might have a crop duster and they just fly it you know, in the country, nowhere near controlled airspace or someone just has a plane they fly on the weekends and they just fly it from a little country airport with no, no controlled airspace, then they don't need to have transponders. So you can't rely on the fact that people will have transponders. Even after 2020, they may not fit them. So in that respect, um, it's a technology which can, again, it can be a 10 or it can be a zero, depending on whether the technology is fitted and used. So there's a huge variation here. And the, the absolute stupidity of the whole thing is that uh, in the 2018 FAA Reauthorization Act, it says that basically models and drones are going to have to have transponders fitted, right? We're going to have to have transponders. So we're going to have the stupid, crazy situation where your little toy drone is going to have to have a transponder and broadcast its position and so forth. Yet um, the manned aircraft just down the road he doesn't, if he's in Class G airspace, uncontrolled airspace, um, he doesn't have to have a radio and he doesn't have to have a transponder. It's safe for him apparently and he's only got 5 out of 10 visual awareness and he gets to fly. But if you want to fly your drone, well you're going to need a transponder. Um, well, how does that work? And you're only flying a toy. This is where the, the regulations at the moment are a little bit unbalanced and adjustments are needed but I'm not going to go into it in this video. Suffice to say, you can be a hero or a zero, depending on whether you use your radio and your transponder. That's it. Now let's go back to here. Now, we can pick up transponders. Yay! And this is a fantastic piece of technology I think every BVLOS FPV should use. And it's things like Flight Radar 24, which is a website which tracks all the aircraft moving around the world almost. It listens out for ADS-B transponders, for FLAM transponders, um, all sorts of things. And it builds up a map of all the aircraft with those transponders, where they're going, where they've come from and it's free, you can get a free use of it. Um, it's got some limitations, the free version, but I think the other one is about $9 a year for the paid version, it's brilliant. So what it means is that you can listen for the transponder. So you cannot, at this stage, you won't have a transponder on your model yourself, but you can listen out. So you'll get a five out of 10 for that, a five out of 10. Same goes over here, five out of 10. If you get something like Flight Radar 24, or you can get your own ADS-B receiver, you can get the little um, software-defined radios, plug into a Raspberry Pi, set it up on your box as a part of your flight system um, with a little LCD screen. It'll tell you if planes are coming. And that's just like, well, total cost would be under 100 bucks to set that up. If that's something people are interested in, I might do a project on that, showing you how to set up an ADS-B receiver for your, uh, for, your flight, for your flight system. You know, people take out a tripod and things for, you, for your base station, put an ADS-B receiver on there. But honestly, it's just so much easier to use Flight Radar 24 if you've got mobile phone or Wi-Fi coverage, so much easier. There you go. So let's add up these scores, shall we? Let's see how we compare to manned aviation when it comes to situational awareness. Right, if you are flying proximity FPV with a spotter, you get a total score of 30. That's a pretty good score. That's your score because you've got two sets of eyes, ears, um, you've got a scanner listening, you've got a you might have rate, flight radar 24. If you use all those technologies and all those abilities, you're up to 30 points on the old battle of the proximity situational awareness. Right, let's go to manned aircraft. You've got, you could have a variety. You could go from just five if you didn't have radar, or if you didn't have your radio turned on and were using it, or if you didn't have a transponder turned on or weren't using it, then you could have anywhere from five to 25. So huge range of scores. And remember, they're all legal. You can go flying in a manned aircraft with a situational awareness score of five. And if you're in uncontrolled airspace, and it's before, uncontrolled, it's totally legal. How can they let you do that? How can they let people fly in an aircraft with no radio, no transponder, and limited visual uh, field of view? How can they do that? I don't know. But let's go back to this is what we're interested in, BV loss, right? So we've got five, five, seven, we've got 17. So it's a much lower score than proximity. And we've got to acknowledge that. It is a much lower score. You have much less situational awareness when you're flying BV loss. For the reasons, obviously, no auditory and uh, your visual is reduced as well. So that's it. But 
The crazy thing is that you could be three times the score of someone flying a manned aircraft and they're allowed to fly, but you're not. How does it work? As I say, this is the regulators need to step back and take a look at this. They don't, they, I don't think they have a set of current information. They haven't, remember, regulators are not doers, they are sayers. You know, you do as we say, you do, we say. Uh, the bottom line is that they have got their learning from a book or from a friend or from an auntie or from an uncle or from um, the internet. So that's all they know about BV loss FPV. So they take a very conservative view and they think, oh, well, you know, this old FPV gear is not very good. And they come up and say, it's too dangerous. Uh, we don't care about the, the old codgers flying their old biplanes out in the back paddock because they've been doing it for years, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's aviation. This is toys. <laughs> Get the drift. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm being a bit political, but I really do believe that's a lot of what goes on here. But we can see safest thing of all is FPV proximity. Uh, I don't think anyone's actually been killed as a result of anyone flying proximity FPV. Plenty of people have been killed as a result of manned aircraft colliding with each other. So there's the proof that situational awareness is much greater when we're flying proximity FPV. And also BV loss. How many people have died as a result of people flying model aircraft BV loss by FPV? Oh, it's a zero. In fact, I could not find one instance of even property damage or injury, let alone death, right? This is, the, the numbers prove this is safe. This is one thing that's a little annoying is, when the regulators start talking about too dangerous, too dangerous, and you say to them, show me the, show me the coffins, show me the damage bills, they can't because there isn't any, but that doesn't matter. It's all what if, what if, but they don't understand that um, what anyone can come up with a what if scenario for anything. What we need to be dealing with when we're talking about regulation and taking away people's rights and freedoms is the evidence, the facts, the numbers, the historical, you know, the history of something. Let's have a look at what's actually happened, because it's more important than what could happen. I mean, I mean, uh, money could fall from the sky, but I'm not relying on it to pay my bills at the end of the month. I go out and I see every month I have to earn money to pay my bills. So I have historical evidence that to pay the bills requires work. So I go to work. I don't just sit around waiting for the money to fall from the sky. Regulators, they seem to have a different tack on this one. So that's situational awareness, and that's how I score them. Now, other people may score them differently. Other people might say, no, 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 no. You know, the manned aircraft is a much better view. I would wager that they haven't flown the latest FPV systems. I honestly would, because otherwise they would probably certainly agree with me here. But now I want to talk a bit about this, you know, manned aircraft. I've mentioned these numbers. Um, countless people have been, well, not countless, but a lot of people have been killed as a result of collisions between manned aircraft. Um, they have a score of 5 to 25. I think a lot of the time it's 5, because too many of them bang into each other even though they're supposed to have the best seat in the house and all this technology, it doesn't always seem to work. How many collisions have there been between recreational uh, beyond visual line of sight model aircraft, not talking about drones, not talking about Phantoms and Mavics, I'm talking about model aircraft flown beyond visual line of sight. How many collisions with manned aircraft have there been? Yep, as far as I can find out, it's another big fat zero. So again, weight of numbers says that this is far less situational awareness than this. But let's have a look. I'm going to show you exactly how these, how these planes crash, how they hit each other, even though they've got all these things working for them. Okay, at great expense, I've had these fantastic drawings of aircraft created for you. So you can see what I'm going to talk about. Low-wing aircraft, high-wing aircraft, they're flying like that. Okay, this is their relative positions. Um, Low-wing pilot can't see the high-wing pilot because the floor, the cowl, the wing, all block his view down. He can't see what's below him like that, right? High wing pilot can't see the low wing pilot because he, the wing, the fuselage, and the, uh, the rest of the thing block his upwards view. So if these two are on a converging path, bad things happen. And this is why I say the radio is one of the most important tools. But even with radio, uh, they can announce they're on the same approach path to a runway, for example, and they're all looking around for each other, but they've got blind spots. And no matter how hard you look, if you if the other plane is in your blind spot, you will not see it. So what do you do? Um, you, you don't know where it is. You think, oh, well, I can't see it. It's all right. And that's what happens all too often. And planes collide and they, people die. I'm, I think if I can find a video, I saw a really good video. I'll put it here at the moment, showing this exact thing happening where a low-wing aircraft descending on a high-wing aircraft as they're coming into land at a rural field and there is a mid-air collision. But if I can't find it, I won't put it up. Anyway, um, so there we go. That's an example of the lack of situational awareness that can occur even in a manned aircraft. And this explains one of the reasons why so many mid-air collisions occur and the difference is. Now, if we have a lightweight foam model, as we're going to build for this project, and we're talking 
Super light. We're talking hopefully under 250 grams, right? That's lighter than your average seagull by a fair margin. Um, if we build a really light aircraft, even if we did hit a manned aircraft, what would happen? Well, it's going to be lighter and more frangible than a drone, a, a phantom. So I think the results would be maybe a dent. But I don't think there'd be any real risk to life or property. And that's the worst case scenario is that actually you hit something. But the reality is that you've got this massive field of view. You've got all these other things we talked about. You've got a score of 17. These guys might only have a score of five. And so the likelihood of you hitting them is incredibly low. In fact, in the entire, as I say, in the entire history of Beyond Visual Light FPV, Beyond Visual Line of Sight FPV model aircraft, there has never been one collision with a manned aircraft. And that just, the numbers prove the fact that it's incredibly safe. The regulators can't get that into their heads, but that's really, you know, something we have to deal with. So this is what happens with situational awareness. We've got, this guy's got all this vision here. Fantastic. This guy's got a little bit less vision here, and he's got some out the side. But this guy can't see. This guy's got a big blind spot here. And a blind spot there. This is all, they're all in each other's blind spots. Bad things will happen. But did the regulator say, well, we shouldn't allow low wing and high wing to coexist in the same airspace. We should separate them vertically by a thousand feet. Just, this is what they're talking about, this is what they do with drones, but it doesn't happen here, does it? No, no, because this is manned aircraft, they're special, they're special, you know. Um, and what can I say? So situational awareness, the thing we have to look at though is because these guys have these big blind spots and our models are very small, we cannot count for one second on in these guys seeing a model if it's being flown beyond visual line of sight. They can see drones from a million miles away out of the cockpits of jet airliners traveling at nearly the speed of sound, but you won't be able to see a foam fixed wing model flying if you're in a lightweight, because that's just the way it works, isn't it? We all know that. Anyway, I digress. <clears throat> what I'm saying is we need to be very much aware that we have to take the responsibility for avoiding collisions. As the hobbyists, the regulations say unmanned aircraft must always give way to manned aircraft. And okay, that's, yeah, um, that's a red. But we have to take the extra assurance to make sure we're never going to be in a position where we enter anywhere near the same airspace as a manned aircraft, because only bad things can happen. So we need to make sure we keep well clear of them. I'm going to do another video on flight planning because that's going to be another important part of this BV You can't just go out, find a field somewhere and fly away into the distance. That is exactly the wrong thing to do. You need to make sure about the area you're flying and you need to identify the risks, the dangers. You need to look at the time of day. You need to look at contingency planning, all these things. You thought it was going to be simple flying BV loss. And if you thought it was going to be simple, um, then you were mistaken. It requires, to do it safely requires a lot of work and that's what we're going to do. A lot of work to make this safe and show the regulators that it can be done safely. And, ah, oh, damn, I left the radio on. And that it's not just a case of going out and tossing a model into the blue and hoping it comes back. No, to be taken seriously, we have to show them that we are acting seriously, we're acting safely and we're taking every measure possible because that's what the regulators want to see. Now, let me just, um, if you don't want to hear me rant, turn off now because I have a little rant. Right now we have the situation with BV loss that a lot of commercial operators want to fly unmanned aircraft BV loss because they know that with the, without the ability to do that, it's not commercially viable. You can't have a drone delivering packages if you have to be looking at it. So it could only go a few hundred meters away if you're watching the drone with your eyes. It's not a point, you might as well just walk down the road and drop it in the gate. No, you need to be able to fly beyond visual line of sight. The regulations say you can't do it without lots and lots of preparation, without special permits. So we have commercial operators who have never done this before because it's illegal and they follow the rules. They've never done this before. They're coming up with all these dissertations, all these safety processes, all these manuals, all these you know, things that they're doing to say, we can do it safely. Look, look at this. We've got three reams of paper says we can do it safely. And the regulators are going, mm, let me weigh that. Ooh, three and a half kilos. Yes, that's very safe. Two and a half kilos. No, I'm sorry. Go back to the drawing board. Um, because neither of them know what's involved. Have they done it? Have the regulators done BV loss FPV? No, they haven't. Have the commercial operators done BV loss FPV? No, they haven't. Who's done it? We have, the community, the hobby have done it. So you would think that if the regulators and the commercial operators had the slightest clue between their ears, they would be coming to the hobby and saying, well, you guys have done this. You guys have done this for over a decade. No one's been injured, no one's been killed, no major property damage that we know of. Tell us how you did it. Tell us, help us produce these dissertations. Tell us what the risks are. Tell us what you've discovered in your many, many BV loss flights. What went wrong? What went right? What do you do to con you know, manage the risk? But they're not doing that. As far as I'm aware, they're not doing that. What they're saying is, you shouldn't be flying beyond visual line of sight. That's their response to the people that are doing it safely every day. 
Um, yet they're going to come out from a position of zero experience and significant ignorance and say, don't worry, we'll do it. That's not the way regulation, that's not the way safety is supposed to work. Safety relies on the, taking advantage of people who've done stuff before and learnt what works and what doesn't work. If you want to do something safely, talk to the people that have done it for years. They're the ones that will tell you how to do it safely. Don't go looking in a book and reading stuff up. It's, it's, it, the people who wrote the book probably haven't even done it. So, yeah, regulators, I hope you're watching this. I hope you're watching because you need to have a you know, change around because I'm trying to educate people how to do this whole thing soft, uh, safely, explaining the risks, explaining the, you know, what can happen. Um, and hopefully a lot of people in the hobby will look at this and if they do decide to fly beyond visual line of sight, they'll take this aboard and they'll do it safely, as safe as possible. However, there's going to be a lot of people who just go out there, buy themselves a mini talon, throw some long range gear in it and half it off the top of a hill somewhere and fly out over a city and cause all sorts of mayhem. Because you have said it's, it's, it's unsafe and so they're just going to do it anyway. So much better to say it's safe but you've got to abide by these rules. And we're happy to provide you with the, all the assistance you need. The hobby will come and we'll help everyone, the commercial operators, will help the regulators get together a set of rules and regulations that will enable anyone to fly BV loss at absolute minimum risk and, you know, quite simply and easily. And then the people that would have otherwise done it alone, they may jump on board and say, well, we'll do it properly. That's what you've got to do. Education, education is the thing. It's the key. That's why I'm standing here in front of this whiteboard and sweating like a pig because it's got hot. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this because education is the key to safety. Regulation doesn't mean nothing. Regulations, I've always said this, regulations are a way for blaming people when bad things happen. They don't stop bad things from happening. I mean, murder is illegal. People get shot every day in the USA. It doesn't stop. It just enables you to blame someone and lock them up when you make a law to prohibit murder. So you need to be proactive. You need to educate people and say, this is why we do this. This is why we don't do this. And this is how you can do this with the least possible risk. It's never going to be totally safe. Nothing is ever totally safe. You can get out of bed in the morning, trip on your slippers and bang your head on a coffee table and kill yourself. Nothing is safe, but we can make the risk small enough that this becomes an acceptable risk. Because as I say, 10 years of BV loss flying, over 10 years of BV loss flying in the hobby, no one's been injured, no one's been killed, and I'm not aware of any property damage. So it can be done safely by people with experience. Will the commercial operators be that good? I don't know. I seem to recall a military drone crashing in the UK somewhere near a school. And hasn't happened with the hobby, has it? No. There you go. That's it. So questions, comments in the usual place. Now the project itself is coming along extremely well. I've got all, I've, I've got my learning curve over with iNav. iNav is, mm, it'll do the job. It will bring your model back from a distance if it goes into fail safe or if you get tired or if you, your mother calls you for tea and you haven't got time to fly it back. All those things, iNav will do that. It's not that flash. The loiter circle, if there's any wind, it turns into something resembling a you know, a pie with a chunk missing, it's, it's rather bad really, but it's adequate, it's adequate and it's easy to set up and easy to configure and I can provide you with all the details. So we'll use INAV as the flight controller because people have said, we want a flight controller. Um, the airframe, as I say, Bonsai and a shadow wing are being used for testing at the moment, but I'm working on the actual airframe which will be either cut from foam or it'll be a foam board thing so you can build it up super cheap because as I said, this has to be a super cheap project because you Whenever you fly BV loss, you have to live with the fact you may never get the model back. If something goes wrong and it lands in a paddock somewhere and you can't find it, it's gone. So we want to keep the cost to a bare minimum. So foam board or foam and super, super light, absolutely super light because, as I said, we, if we do have the worst case scenario and we hit an aircraft, we don't want it to do any damage. So again, push a prop at the back, lots of foam to cushion the impact if you have any. All these things, safety first, safety first. That's our number one priority. Um, there you go. So as I say, comments, questions in the usual place. Uh, this has been way longer than I hoped it would be, but it's an essential video and there'll be some more safety ones coming up before we get into the actual mechanics of doing the thing because I, I can't stress too, too strongly that I don't want to be held responsible if someone comes along and says, oh, you told these people they could fly beyond the visual line of sight and now 300 people are dead. It's all your fault. No, I'm saying you, you're not allowed to do it. I'm saying I know you're going to do it anyway, so I'm going to try and help you do it in the way that poses the least possible risk to anybody, which is why we had today's video. There you go. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.